Hello, this is Robert McMullen, MD. I'm a psychiatrist in New York City, and uh, I've been doing psychopharmacology for some 35 years or more, meaning that I really specialized in medication more than other people and avoided doing much psychotherapy. Actually, after 1988, I've done really none, except I do talk to people. And so then I have about 500 patients. And uh, I went to Georgetown Medical School, Columbia for Psychiatry, and, um, and did this somewhat specialized uh, area for a long time, although all psychiatrists are psychopharmacologists in a way. Uh, and about 10 years ago, I got a TMS machine, transcranial magnetic stimulation. I wanted to talk about Parkinson's. They've been using TMS for Parkinson's, you know, for at least 10 years, and there's been evidence that it works. Although I've had a very hard time getting any patients. The neurologist, I guess, just don't believe it. Sounds weird. And, uh, and the rationale is not obvious. You know, doctors like to see studies, but they like also to understand what the reason is. Like, um, there's something called... Uh, transcranial direct current stimulation where you run a little e electricity through the brain and that has studies going back uh, 50 years of uh, it helping depression and anxiety although it's usually not a home run but anyway I wanted to treat Parkinson's and uh, I've only treated about five the first one came in a religious lady and she had severe Parkinson's. Her arms were going like this. She had slurred speech. When she walked, I had to hold her elbow or, or her husband. She needed help to make sure she didn't fall down. And, uh, and she couldn't go any higher on the Parkinson's medication without feeling really sick. She came to me for depression and anxiety. And I said, uh, you know, <laughs> your main problem is the Parkinson's. And uh, let's go next door. So I took her next door and I did the first treatment on her. I was really happy to get this case finally. Uh, after five or six treatments, she came over here because I have a Brainsway machine with a helmet that's designed for Parkinson's. And I use the regular MagPro figure eight machine in, in the treatment there which we actually continued using because it's more convenient to her, for her to go there. And her um, son-in-law said to me, I, I'd like, is it okay if I tell you something about your mother? I said, yeah, it's perfectly ethical. <laughs> tell me anything you want, write a book. But I can't tell you anything about her. And uh, he said, well, you know, we just had Pesach. And for the last couple of years or three years, she just makes an appearance. She comes in for 10 minutes and then she goes up upstairs, Pesach is Passover. And because uh, she's so embarrassed that she can't cut her own food, she doesn't talk that well, it's hard to walk. It was just very embarrassing. And this time, after just five or six TMS treatments, she walks in, she looks normal, she talks normally, she cuts her own food. You know, people were just amazed. It's like she's back to normal. And that was only five or six treatments. So uh, after 10 treatments, I wanted to stop because she was doing so well. Why, why continue? But no, she wanted to do more and, and she wanted to, and she did over 20. And uh, I complained about this. I thought it was too, too many. You know, so why? And her husband said, well, you know, whatever she wants, I, I'll do it. That's all. I said, listen, if there's reincarnation, I want to come back as your wife. And... Uh, and she did really well for six months, and then she had a bit of a relapse, and unfortunately I didn't see this, and uh, she came in and my assistant, uh, Joey, he did a few more treatments and she was back to where she is. Now, it's a couple years later, I'm not sure exactly where she is, uh, but you know, the family tells me, you know, they're, you know, they're getting along and for some reason they, 
just haven't come back for more. Now, then another fellow, oh yeah, by, by the way, her UPDRS scale, Unified Parkinson's, I forget what it all means, but it's, uh, it's a scale that's standard for Parkinson's. Her, her scale came down from 70 to 30, so it was a 57% decrease. And then I had an older man, 87, who's the father of one of my patients, and his, his uh, score was 34, and he came down to 16 after 11 treatments. So that was a 53% decrease. And, uh, and he was a, a bit different when he went home. He went out, he walked around the swimming pool, he was doing much more things. And then he got in the car and drove away, <laughs> or went for a drive, and that really upset his wife because um, she didn't want him driving. And, uh, and that was a rule, but he did okay. You know. the, uh, and he, he got a lot less stiff. His main problem was the stiffness. And, uh, and then there was another lady. This is the third lady that was the only three successes I had. And she, uh, she had uh, Lewy body disease, which is a disorder like Parkinson's. But 95% of dementia is Parkinson's and maybe 5% or so is, is Lewy body. And they're very similar, that you go down fast. Lewy body, you're a little more likely to have hallucinations and things as, as the illness gets worse. Uh, sometimes you can't really diagnose it until an autopsy is done. Now, she also had pretty bad depression and she had some very Parkinsonian symptoms. And uh, her score went to from 50 down to 30 and uh, she had 61 treatments over a year. So she kept coming in at intervals because she was better and wanted to stay better. And, uh, and uh, I think the Parkinson's was much better, was uh, a lot improved before that. Now, her depression scale, the madras went down 72%. And, uh, the most interesting thing is that on the mini mental status exam, her score was 11. I think the maximum is 30, if I remember right. And this is uh, a test for people's dementia, their cognition. And generally with Lewy body and with, uh, part with uh, Alzheimer's, they go down very rapidly in a couple of years and uh, often end up in a nursing home fairly quickly. And most people don't live past about five years, although there are a lot of exceptions, uh, when they have this type of illness. Uh, her score was 11, which is not good, at the beginning of the treatment. And one year later, it was still 11. And uh, that's quite amazing. You would really expect it to go down. Although maybe it stayed uh, okay because she was much less depressed and could think better. I'm not sure. But it also might be the fact that I had her on low-dose lithium, 150 milligrams, 150 milligrams, and the TMS. Because they both uh, raise the BDNF, uh, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is sort of the growth hormone of the brain. And when it's low, it causes depression and, uh, and it's neuroprotective, which would possibly have something to do with her not declining. Now, lithium prevents Alzheimer's or really reduces the risk. In Texas, there were a few counties where the Alzheimer's rate was quite low, much lower than it is with the same type of people a couple hundred miles away. And finally, someone noticed, I'd like to know the story about this, who, who did this and how, that these counties had more lithium in the drinking water. It was only about a third of a milligram. But since then, there have been at least three studies showing that taking lithium reduces cognitive decline. 
I think both in people that have a lot of cognitive impairment, but not Alzheimer's, and uh, some people with early Alzheimer's. Uh, the most impressive study was uh, in the British Journal of Psychiatry, and they took a bunch of people with mild cognitive impairment, MCI, and this is an official diagnosis. It's people that usually are quite older and that their memory and cognition are definitely abnormally low compared to their peers. But some of them don't go on to get Alzheimer's and some of them do. So they put half of them on a low dose of lithium. I think it was only one milligram and uh, maybe half a milligram. And those people on lithium were less likely to convert to Alzheimer's. It was very impressive. Uh, so I frequently have people take lithium. If they have a tendency to depression, I really want them to take 150 milligrams because it may well help their depression. And if, uh, and lithium is very neuroprotective. Even on a low dose, if you are in a car accident and damage your brain, 50% more of the brain will survive. Uh, and this was uh, demonstrated with some really excellent research, elegant research on animals. So, so lithium will help also for uh, Parkinson? Uh, I don't think there's uh, anything, you know, the last I looked, but I haven't looked in a while, I don't think there's any uh, research that shows that it helps prevent Parkinson's. I have another question. So the TMS will help Parkinson, but how many treatments, I need to understand how many treatments uh, you need to take and uh, how long does it take? The Parkinson's? The treatment. I mean the treatment for, uh, yeah, for Parkinson's. Yes. Yeah, I think the Brainsway company suggests 18 treatments like three times a week, which would be about six weeks, and then to reevaluate. And I really don't know. I'm really not up on the literature because I haven't that, had that many patients where I have to go read about it. Uh, but with these people, it was an average of 31 treatments. 22 treatments with one person. It was only 12 treatments with the older man who was 83. And... Uh, and then a lot of treatments for the uh, lady who had, uh, who was a young lady, I think she was just about 60, and she had 61 treatments, but I think her, all those treatments was partly to keep her depression at bay. I think it'll end up being a wide range of, of amounts of treatment that people will need. And how soon you can see the improvement? In the I don't know. But these people were pretty quick. You know, the fellow that uh, only needed 12, he was obviously improving when he was halfway there. And the, the lady who uh, improved so much for the uh, Pesach dinner, she had only had five or six when there was this massive improvement. And I don't, I, I don't know that the following treatments improved her that much above uh, what she was. Now, so uh, out of those three people, there was an average of a 50% decrease in their score and an average of 31 treatments. Now, let me tell you about who didn't respond. There was um, one fellow who had dystonic movements, like Michael J. Fox, where his had movements like this, but he didn't have any stiffness. So that's really a different Parkinsonism or Maybe it's more advanced. I'm not an expert, but one of my friends who had Parkinsonism, she was much older than me, but we went to dinner a lot, and, and, uh, and she had Parkinson's when we used to go to dinner, and then years later, she was at home and had all of these movements and was on a lot of medicine. Um, now, and then there was uh, another fellow who... Uh, I, I think he stopped after 20 or so treatments. I'm trying to get follow-up on him, but he didn't seem to have any benefit. And then there was one who was actually 
a friend of my wife's for 40 years and a friend of mine for 20 years. And uh, after, she was very stiff and uh, unstable walking and she was being reduced on her uh, Parkinsonian's medication because they wanted to switch her to something else. And after five or six treatments, she was better. She was walking better, faster, she looked good. And, uh, and a neurologist told me that when you lower the medicines, people never look better. <laughs> They're getting worse during that time. And here she was getting better, so I'm sure it was working. But for some reason, we, we couldn't uh, induce her husband and her to keep coming in for treatments. I guess they, they just didn't believe it. And, uh, and, uh, and we, you know, since they were friends for so long, we told them, we won't charge you, just come in, just do it. But we, we didn't get anywhere. So out of the five people that we treated, three of them did at least 50% better. And uh, so that would make 60%. Now this is a very small number. This, you know, you can't really say much about uh, the percentages that will get better or how long it'll get better. We only got five people. <clears throat> you know, it's like me telling my wife that I beat her three times at chess and she only won twice. So therefore I'm a better chess player. Uh, statistically, that's not good. Now, if I won 500 and she won three or I won 300 and she won two, then I'm probably a better chess player. That's what statistics is about. And uh, the problem is, is, is uh, obtaining patients. And uh, I've written to a number of neurologists, but they, they don't send patients. I guess they don't believe it. I'm really sorry I didn't take a video, especially of um, the first lady, because she changed so dramatically. And, and a picture is worth, especially with an illness like that, it's worth 10,000 words. On the internet, I think you can find some before and after pictures. But the one that was really dramatic, when I took the Harvard course, uh, Alvaro Pasquale showed us this uh, man down in uh, Chile. And there's a researcher down there. He's actually a PhD. And they had the fellow stand up. They said, stand up from the chair and walk over here. It was about two yards. And it was painfully slow for him to get up and move and get that one or two yards. Then they showed a, a video of him, I believe it was about two weeks later, and they said, come on over here to the other side of the room. And he gets up and he just walks across. <laughs> it was amazing. Now, when he was walking, he had a little bit of movements, and uh, Dr. Pasquale said, see the movements? That means he's on Parkinsonian medication, and he's on too much now. And that's what's causing the movements. And uh, because, you know, it was now time for him. Anyway, uh, oh, real quick, where do you treat? You treat on the motor strip, uh, which is this area of the brain, and, you know, and, and generally up here in the middle, and that gets most of the trunk of the body, and you do an excitatory treatment. It doesn't seem logical exactly. It seems like maybe you'd want to do inhibitory, but it's excitatory. And I read a paper recently, and I may be wrong about this, and I believe the lady treated on the supplementary motor area, just anterior, and did an inhibitory treatment. But anyway, there's going to be different treatments. I that want come to highlight out. another thing, Doctor Wu, because usually people that watch our, our, our YouTube channel of compound depression and they already know what is TMS, but I want to highlight that TMS is not exclusive and not painful and yeah, the TMS uh, is usually not painful. You now, if you put it up high enough, then uh, it will be because the magnetic field is right against the scalp. So then when you go higher, you know, you'll, you'll tense it up. Of course, we go slowly and somebody, if somebody says, wait a minute, that's too, pain, too uncomfortable, then we just stay low. Uh, we had a lady today and we wanted to go uh, you know, to at least 90%, preferably 120% of her MT. That means motor threshold, but anyway. 
but she could only tolerate to 65%. Now that may be enough. We're treating her two different places, so the other place by itself may work out. But after a few treatments, sometimes the muscles accommodate and then you can go higher. And, and the discomfort, people, often we can't get high enough when we do this uh, orbital frontal treatment because I think there's just more facial muscles here in order to make, uh, you know, to, to smile and move and give signals. So there's a lot more muscles here. So this is harder to get up to a, a treatment level you might want. Whereas on the scalp, it's much easier. But uh, it's, it's really painless generally. And, and you just uh, have the treatment, it takes half an hour. There's some new theta burst pulses where you can do the whole treatment in 40 seconds or in 30 minutes. That makes it easier to treat in two or three places at once. And then you get up and you go to school or you go to work and it's not interfering with your day at all except the time invested in coming over here and going back. And that's why it'd be a lot better if we had a lot more psychiatrists doing this. Anyway, this is uh, Robert McMullen and I've been talking a little bit about Parkinson's which really does respond to, uh, to TMS frequently. Oh, you were asking about lithium and all the time. One quick thing. I did see an article where somebody predicted, he said that since the cell death in Parkinson's is the same cell death, the same spiral of events as in the Parkinson's and the Alzheimer's are the same as the way the cell death ha happens, that the lithium might hel help um, slow the, the course. But I, I don't know if there's any research on that. They did do research using lithium on a, a ALS, I can't remember the whole name right now, a amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and it didn't help at all. But that's a very fast illness, and, uh, and that might be the reason why. Anyway, this is Robert McMullen. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist in New York, and I just was speaking a little bit about Parkinsonism, and I'll learn a lot more about it when I get some more patients. In fact, I just, I just started a, a new patient so I'm starting to read more so that I, I can find out what alternatives there are and, uh, and when I should s expect to see benefit. Oh, and most of these treatments now, are you can probably do them twice a day. With depression, the evidence is, is if you do it twice a day, you'll finish just as well in 15 days as if you do it once a day in 30 days. And it may work out with other disorders like Parkinson's. Okay, thank you very much.